Hey listeners, let's talk about revolutionizing your mining operation with Foreman. This isn't your average management tool. It's an all-in-one solution for reducing costs and significantly boosting your revenue. Foreman brings a cutting edge dashboard to your fingertips, empowering you with automated energy strategies. This means not only curtailing around real-time prices, but also strategically enhancing your profit margins through demand response. It's about leveraging energy efficiency to its fullest potential. With Foreman, you get a system that scales with your business, inventory management for assets, infrastructure integration, and business intelligence. Foreman elevates the cash flow and production of your entire operation. To see how Foreman can redefine your mining operation standards, visit foreman.mn. With Foreman, you're not just managing a mining operation, you're setting a new standard in the industry. Accelerated by Compass is the premier accelerator program for Bitcoin mining sites at any stage of development. Our managed services provide expert guidance in site procurement, construction, energy agreements, and mining operations. Compass helps clients meet timelines and expectations for operational excellence from greenfield to retrofits and everything in between. Don't just mine, excel. Visit compassmining.io now to discover how Accelerated by Compass can power your success. Are you a retail or institutional investor interested in Bitcoin mining companies? The Miner Mag brings you free data and analysis from all major NASDAQ listed Bitcoin mining operations to know who stands out. Check out visualized metrics and data dependent stories at theminermag.com. Hey, welcome back to the Mining Pod. We did not do our news roundup last week, so Charlie and I are jumping on the horn to talk about Bitcoin ASICs. So we're just going to jump right into it. I've been traveling uh, as a WDMS. Thank you to the Bitmain team for flying me out and putting me up in a hotel. That was pretty nice. We got to take a look at these ASICs. So now we're going to do our part and talk about them a little bit. Uh, if you did not follow them on Twitter or follow any events, you're in a good spot because we will go through new ASICs that they launched and announced, uh, some information about them, and then we'll compare against the rest of the market, the rest of the horses out there. Uh, and then we'll finish up with some thoughts on like what the ASIC market is going to look like in the future. Uh, nicely... Place, I think, because we've done a few shows recently, especially the one with Epic Blockchain, uh, Earl May, about like where the ASIC market's going to go. So there's that. Charlie, how are you doing though? I'm doing fantastic. Uh, Will, a lot of people ask, you know, why aren't you at these uh, conferences? And and I say, well, Will and I are tag teaming. Will's at the, uh, the mining heavy conferences. I'm at the Bitcoin tech and ordinals related conferences, but we do meet in the middle for the mining pod. I wore last cycle's hottest t-shirt for this. <laughs> Alex Weiss's What If, um, I think this might be a reference to uh, whatever uh, Plan B's S2FXL, whatever it is. Whatever the, you get I got this, I think, off the street of Miami. So um, <laughs> <laughs> now that we're not going back to Miami for uh, the, the BTC Miami, I, I don't, I think this shirt might be a rare commodity. It is a rare commodity. Uh, I'm in Miami, however, for Mining Disrupt this week. So we're recording this Sunday night before Mining Disrupt. There's going to be everyone here. Uh, If you hear this, it'll be coming out Tuesday morning. So I'll be there at Mining Disrupt still because it's Tuesday, Wednesday. It's the main days. uh, And then Monday tomorrow as well. But yeah, I'll be there. So if you're around, come say hi to me. I'll be walking around the booth and doing MC work and would love to chat and say hi. Let's jump into the ASIC stuff. Uh, so yes, last week, WDMS, it was Monday, Tuesday, really great conference. I have not been to Las Vegas before, even though it's not that far from Denver. Uh, that place was really overwhelming. Good spot for a conference though. Pretty easy to get around. Um, the thing that caught my eye and everyone's interest at the event was one, some ordinal stuff that Bitmain talked about, which was interesting to get like their perspective on. Maybe we'll touch on that uh, on a later show. And then two, the announcement of the S21 XP and the S21 XP immersion hydro units. Uh, So we'll start off with that. For the S21 XP hydro, it clocked in at 473 tera hash per second at 12 joules per tera hash, uh, $21 $21 per tera hash after the coupon. And it's not going to ship until Q4 of this year slash Q1 of next year. Then for the S21 XP, they have it clocking at 273 tera hash and 13.5 joules per terahash. I didn't get the number on the pricing for this one, uh, but I assume it's in within that ballpark as we're seeing like all the competitors be there. Uh, we'll throw some images up on the screen. So if you're watching this on TV, definitely gonna see that normal form, form factor for all these things. Uh, the one thing that we should talk about, Charlie, though, is like it does seem that Bitmain is really pushing like their ant pool boxes now. 
those last variants or versions didn't do super well in the field, especially in West Texas, where like the water's not great. Like it's, there's a lot of calcium in the water. Uh, so I want to get your thoughts on that, but any thoughts on the initial a six and those numbers? 473 terahashes for a single mining rig is crazy. I, you know, what's interesting is that, um, there's right now, a lot of the conversation is about how does mining and AI fit together and in what ways and behind all that, the backdrop of this conversation is where's the energy come from? And, um, a lot of people, Mark Zuckerberg was quoted um, saying, I think one of the constraints of future AI growth is the ability to um, power all of it. And if we're looking at that, there is a lot of compute which will compute for the same power, um, compute which can fit into a smaller footprint, which can pack way more hash, hashes into a box and make it increasingly more efficient. That allows you, that may be a, uh, a defining competitive advantage over the next several years, energy may start to get tight or as these things may be more directly competitive in some ways. Yeah, I mean, like the era of having a petahash and that being like interesting is over uh, because it's all industrial, not industrialized now. And I also think like we're going to be moving towards a world where just like a few megawatts is an exahash as well. And that's a, a much different world from 2020, 2021. If you had a Bitcoin miner for 2020 or 2021 and be like, you know, I have an exahash, like, you're cooking over there, but now it's like it's like good. Like that's that's a lot of hash rate under management, but in a year or two, like that will be pretty small. Um, so pretty expensive, though I will say, because like the energy contracts are still there, and like these units are expensive. But you know yeah, what's interesting? The other the other interesting thing is that um, we're now probably in where the past year has been predefining where um, people who built out really post China exit, China mining exit uh, in the U.S have been swapping out and upgrading their fleets and may not have added significant extra power capacity, but their hash rate is skyrocketed. This is an interesting meta where um, it's kind of the, it's the, the Tom from Kleng, how do you, however you say his company, the uh, rack space is the, the real commodity. Oh, yeah. Kungsleden. Yeah. Like that may, he, he's looking very prescient right now where, um, if you have rack space, you can now you have the option of like, how do you want to fill that rack space? You have a lot of options right now. Yeah, just like to keep pulling on this thread here. If you had, say, 10 to 20 megawatts and were able to continuously bring in new performant units because you have like good deal flow from Bitmain or from brokers and also have like a good exit strategy to get out of your old units and send them to someone else, like a good liquidation strategy you could be very performant against the rest of the market because you're just making your amount of energy more dense. Now, that being said, it's really hard to do that. Like, it's really hard to get new units on the rack and get old units someone else and not have a huge cost uh, in between there. But I, I do agree with you. Like, having that rack space is going to have a, a huge premium. Uh, that seems to be more on the energy side of things as well, which was a huge topic at WDMS with uh, the announcements around interest in AI. And I think like last week, we saw a ton of different announcements about how these AI companies are going to need gigawatts uh, pretty shortly here and how like the gigawatt is like the new standard. Funny enough, there was actually an HPC uh, utility energy conference right upstairs at the Bitmain WDMS conference, uh, just on a different floor. And uh, as Jensen Huang, he's the CEO of NVIDIA, was giving a, a presentation. So a bunch of Bitcoin miners tried to slip upstairs and uh, hear him talk. But of course, they got snagged in the hallway because that wasn't going to work. But that tells uh, you a lot about the industry crossover. I think that's really interesting. Yeah. yeah. I mean, uh, HUD 8 was at both, I believe. So I think Asher, I saw Asher at WDMS. And then i pretty sure I saw him like tweeting that he was upstairs at, at some point talking about it. And so there's some nice crossover there. And a few of these companies have been pushing that for a while. And I've been kind of been a skeptic. They are looking smart, even if they don't have anything deployed, because they seem to be in the right place. Um, going back to the ASIC talk really quickly, the purchase price after coupons is, of course, the big thing um, for those who are really interested in this portion. Bitmain is continuously doing its uh, phase purchases, so you can purchase the unit ahead of time and have like payments, payment plans spread out. This won't go until Q4, Q1. We'll see if that 
is up to date. There's often delays around these things, of course. Uh, and the last thing I'll note is like for people who purchase just like the S21 or the S21 immersion, as opposed to or Hydro, S21 Hydro, excuse me, you can upgrade, I think, to like these XP versions by doing like some sort of Terra hash swap. So there is that option. Uh, let's talk about these new ant spaces a little bit. And I actually reached out to some people who I know are running these in Texas. They're running like, the last versions. So this was like a big deal, I from what I remember. And I'd love to get your thoughts as like an operator. But last cycle, there was like these new ant spaces rolled out. They're basically containers with some sort of cooling unit attached, like a dry cooler or a hot cooler attached to them. And they're running like the hydro machines. Uh, the issue with them from what I remember is one, really pricey. Two, logistically tra- challenging to get everything installed. Three, the water portion for this is hard because you're having to re- refill these tanks quite a bit or have to like drill a well on site to be able to fill the, the hydro. Uh, and the last part was like these units do have like very tiny parts on them with like tubes and things. And a lot of times they break. I'm wondering if this is something that's going to continue with this new series. Uh, I don't have good information and no one's really like really deployed these things at scale yet to my knowledge, but the last generation did suffer those defects and I've heard people are pretty unhappy about it. Uh, However, I do think like these, like these systems do make sense. Right. And that's why you're seeing other groups as well, build them out like micro BT. And I think there's even like a a giga version where they're kind of like built in like the M 63, hydro unit into a container like this so the design does seem to be like where the industry is moving in the competitive world of bitcoin mining one name stands out clean spark america's bitcoin miner at clean spark efficiency isn't just a goal it's our standard our sophisticated facilities are built and led by expert teams who care about bitcoin and the communities we work in scale we've mastered it our large-scale operations have set us apart in the industry as examples of community-oriented building our track record speaks for itself we navigate the complexities of the new economy with precision and with skill continuously achieving operational milestones curious about how we do it we invite you to discover the story behind cleanspark success at cleanspark.com um, we saw perhaps hints of this where um, Bitmain started to release uh, their first rig, which was uh, in what, their first three-phase rig, which is really more optimally designed to just be plugged into. It's more of a holistic consideration to building up a, a mining deployment. Um, you don't. It makes a lot more sense to from a power management. Um, you don't have to. It built by these special PDUs and panels. It makes that like direct plug-in process easier. And maybe that's because they actually realize that it's better to plug these directly into these boxes like this. Um, I don't generally don't want to ever be the first person to buy the new box from anybody, even if it's uh, an ant space. I guess formerly called ant box. Is that the actual the, the new name is ant space? Uh, I don't know. I, I, Let's see. I know they used to be called ant boxes. Anyway, the 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 nomenclature notwithstanding, um, (laughs) the first the first like ant boxes that arrived, unplugged from China in twenty one and moved over and then kind of like sold on the secondary in the United States, were pretty underwhelming. They didn't handle heat very well. I didn't operate or own any, but I've set up some deals with them, and you don't want to be setting these up in the you know the lower hotter united part of the united, the united states so um i i'm interested to see what the the new crop looks like um it especially for like the hydro which seems to be as we talk about the difference between air cooled immersion and hydro hydro seems to be the the best bang for the i don't want to say best bang for the buck one of just the best performance setups and that's when you have to kind of design the full closed loop uh, system with uh, like water pumping system into the container itself. So um, I, yeah, I will love to get the firsthand accounts of operators here in the United States who are, who are running these. 
we'll see where I, where they go. Um, I think this might even a topic we thought about talking about, which is, does this get us closer to commoditization of like the mining rig unit and like where that's going? You know, whenever we see manufacturer r- mining rig manufacturers ship these boxes basically designed to put a specific type of mining rig inside of it, that gets really close to an industry which I think can be highly scalable and highly commoditized. What do you think? Yeah, let's run through some of the numbers here. Uh, and I just like that it is ant spaces now. So perhaps uh, the nomenclature is changing. Yeah, they have a few designs as well. It's the HW5, MD5, and HK3. Uh, I have not looked into those. They seem to be just different variants of the same thing. So the other units that we should look at, and this kind of informs where we're thinking about this commodification idea. So the seal miner from BitDeer, I, no one's really running them yet because the first generation, I don't think was ready for production. I believe that it's just being run internally, uh, but they did purchase Deweezy Miner, Deweezy Miner, however you say it. We talked about that, that on the show, I think two weeks ago at this point. The dynamics of that deal, not super interesting to me at this time. What is interesting is the fact that they purchased them to be able to up their chip game. And that also BitDeer has an allocation on TSMC because of GM Wu, who uh, you know, ran Bitmain once upon a time before uh, the split in 2018, 2019. So they are moving towards under 10 joules per terash. From top of mind, uh, I believe their goal is five joules per terash was the announcement from March was like the stated goal. I don't think they're there yet. And I think they're building that their way there. Uh, for the record, that's from memory. So it could be off a little bit, but the goal is under 10 joules per terash. The numbers for the Bitmain ones we just looked at again are S21 XP is 13.5 joules per terash. And the S21 XP immersion was 12 joules per terash. So they're right there as well. And like within a year, right, we could be below that. For Kanan, their Avalon Miner A1566 is at 18.5 joules per terash. That was announced in May. It's an air cooled unit. The micro BT is a what's minor M63S is at 18.5 joules per terash. That's an immersion unit. And the M60S, 18.5 joules per terash, which is an air cooled unit. So we kind of have a split in the market where, you know, Bitmain still ahead by a few joules per terash. It's going to save you money over the long term. Uh, they are slightly more expensive. Uh, and of course, Bitmain's always been knocked for like how heat sensitive the units are compared to Canon and micro BT. That's why a lot of people would prefer them especially in like West Texas, but serious operators still prefer Bitmain. I think you can see that in like the purchase orders for public companies. Uh, you, I'll you, let you, you respond. Let's talk about Yeah, cost. you say that. I mean, because I just spoke to a super major miner uh, this past week who operates mainly in hot arid zones over the Middle East. And they're almost entirely the hydro-cooled what's miners. And they spoke very highly of them because uh, of their just, uh, they are in- incredibly uh, performant in the heat. They just don't really break down. They can go, they can safely operate at a higher temperature and in the field, it, it works really well. Um, I, this has kind of been my own personal strategy is that uh, what's miners just generally need less work. And um, this large miner doesn't use firmware. So I think that's also really, I, I, you know, we might, we're probably seeing just different operators prefer different manufacturers. I think that is great to see. You know what I was going to bring up, though, because you said that the uh, Bitmain units are a bit higher priced. Are people as sensitive to prices on these anymore? Because I remember like people used to like split hairs on, oh, well, there's this other rig, which is slightly lower price right now. I see operators, you know, have a specific rig in mind first. So they prefer to deploy and then they will figure out how to buy that specific rig. And they're they're less sensitive to pricing. And, and, and the people I've talked to over the past year, which is interesting because I think the industry might have been way more price sensitive in the past. Maybe that's a sign of commodi- commoditization where different manufacturers have different strengths and weaknesses. 
Yeah, there's one ASIC jet I'm in, and we, we talked a little bit about this with the T21 versus the S21 units, right? We're like, I think the T21 were a little bit cheaper. We saw Bit Farms deploy and scale with that, a huge purchase order. I believe it was in the sum of like $80 million for the year, and kind of rolling out with different, uh, different payment schemes on top of that. I think what we see with these ASICs right now is like, yes, the prices are slightly different and it's going to be cheaper depending on your provider with different trade-offs. However, you might have certain equipment where the pricing is going to uh, be cheaper to go with a Bitmain unit because you already built out, say, three-phase if you're going to run with the T21 versus not doing so with the other units. So it all comes back to like what have you already built on the ground for like a new operator out there. I, I assume like the whole schedule is it's maybe a little simpler because you're just you know, buying everything for a greenfield site. But if you have equipment already, like, yeah, do you really want to be changing all these cables out? Uh, probably not. So you're probably going to go with like yeah. who you want to go with. Uh, and there's, there's other aspects of that, with your PDUs, things like that, which I'm not super into uh, fight, figuring that stuff out. I do think just looking at these numbers is an interesting thing. If you're a miner, that's your own problem to solve. So I won't, I won't get into it. For the commodification part, like the thing that interests me is what we talked about with Earl May and that big blockchain show we did with them at Consensus about a month ago now, uh, which is crazy. I think this month has flown by. And his point was, hey, like over the next two years, all these different systems are going to become so similar. There's not going to be too much of a difference in performance, the power, um, the cost of running the unit. And we're seeing that now once we get to, you know, under 10 joules per terahash, like does, does it change too much? Um, if, you know, if you have that much output, I think the pricing would be the biggest thing. And then like the aftermarket products and the other, the extraneous things like where you created in the U S or not, do you have nice repair teams all over the U.S.? Uh, do you have parts and services? Is there control boards that integrate well? What is the PDU setup? Like, are you using similar things? So I think that's what's going to matter more in the future as this becomes more commodified and we're getting there. I would argue pretty quickly, uh, you said before the show that you think like there's still a little leg room in front of us here. The one thing that interests me in terms of commodification is like that's where we get to the the, the memeable stuff with Bitcoin mining, a lot of people like to talk about with like using ASIC heat aftermarket for warming homes or for growing tulips, stuff like that. Those stories we've seen all the time. That's where that stuff comes into play, in my opinion, because the cost of production because becomes so similar across the entire market. Whereas today, it's still pretty divergent depending on like your power and your ability to procure ASICs. But I think you have a slightly different opinion. Um, yeah, I, in the middle, it's actually I had to quick Google the difference between the words commodification and commoditization. They're both real words and they mean slightly different things. So, okay. but in Here response to your question, well, um, you should, which one should I have used? <laughs> I believe <laughs> um, I think it is commoditization. I okay. think with a T, like stalactite. So um, uh, I'm I'm kind of just taking this position because I really appreciated Earl's perspective that we're, we may be nearing uh, commoditization much quicker, which I'd love to see. But just for sake of the argument, I'll, I'll lay out kind of how I've thought about things. To me, um, the, it is still a little bit of a, an immature industry for us to have things that we call mining rigs, which are these discrete computers, which we plug into a wall where the, Computer is separate than the cord manufacturer, separate than the PDU manufacturer, separate than the everything up basically to the switch gear. And so, um, in my view, when we see the, uh, I think, uh, almost like the shipping container is your ASIC miner. That to me, uh, where the shipping container is the entire footprint and you flash that thing off and on and it's optimized as a whole unit, that to me makes sense. Uh, for like directionally where we're going, you see this in What's Miner basically manufactures containers for uh, their M56, whatever their Hydro series, which are built to purpose for that particular ASIC model. I think that directionally makes more sense. We don't see that yet outside of the Ant Miner Hydro boxes. So, um, 
I think that's where we're heading. And that could take a little while longer because it's basically an entirely different business than than manu- than uh, assembling, than, like procuring foundry space and the chips and assembling them to a, a rig overall. Like that means almost like back what I believe Bitfury did um, five to eight years ago. They kind of delivered whole boxes, I think. They had a maybe like 15 and 16. They did that a few times. So I think that would be directionally where we're headed. And I think when we reach that, when it is common for you to buy shipping containers, which are the ASIC themselves, uh, that's going to be the point where we say this is when the R industry fully commoditized. Commoditized versus commodification. (laughs) Yeah, that's why you're on the show. You're earning your paycheck right there. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay. So no, that's that's a good correction and noted. And I agree with you on all that as well. I think it's just a different perspective. Need ASIC help? Check out Bitamine, one of Bitmain's certified repair shops located in Washington State, with satellite offices in Colorado, Oklahoma, and Texas. PSUs, hashboards, immersion setups, in and out of warranty repair, Bitamine has you covered. Want to train your technicians? Bring Bitamine to your site for hands-on training in the art of ASIC repair, complete with Bitmain AMTC certification. Contact Vitamine today at dan at vmasic.com. Again, that's dan at vmasic.com. When you think of ASIC repair, think Vitamine. What I want to talk about as we kind of close up here is like the Aradines of the world and the Marathon 2 picks, those sort of things. Any thoughts on like these really late movers who definitely like at least a generation behind? Like if you're looking at Aradine specs right now versus these guys, like they're almost arguably two generations behind at this point. Uh, these new S21 XP units have not been delivered and won't be till the end of the year. But like, I saw them like in person. They're working right now. They're just like building them out still. Uh, is it going to? Can you float by? You know, not just not running on your cash and burning cash, or is it too late to really enter this market? Um, I don't know the answer to this. If I did, I'd probably be able to figure out which uh, public mining equity to put more of. Um, <laughs> I, I am. I always bend towards optimism because I think a lot of what it's not. It's maybe it's not like what you do; it's how you do it. So I think it can work. I think in a scenario where um, <laughs> procuring HPC or specifically SHA two fifty six miners, Bitcoin miners becomes very difficult. In the future where that uh, uh, supply chain gets tight, maybe there's increased turmoil to the, to our west over in Asia, then that could be an incredibly valuable uh, supply chain and contract to have. But I don't know if that's a very good, like confident direction you can bet on right now. Um, I would probably not be super confident in a miner who is only the Aradine or uh, like the you know only have Aradine. I think that's a great, um, you know, it might be it might make a lot of sense to have a portion of your fleet like uh, that just for testing, and so you can iterate on that quicker. I don't know the 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 ASIC manufacturing business is hard, and that's kind of why you know Jihan and 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 uh, Bitmain historically have dominated so so commandingly. They have, I mean, RN does have cash roll with Marathon, which is nice. And Block, with their idea of working on a Bitcoin miner, still working on that. They have cash, right? It's a $50 billion company. Um, so there's that as well. I think for the chain reaction of the world and others, it's a little more open question. So we'll see about that. We have had shows with all those people as well. So if you want to go through the archives and learn more about those ASICs, feel free to do so. Charlie, we'll wrap up here. We will be doing a show with Portland Hoddle from your podcast, Bitcoin Season 2, on the Thursday episode. Portland Hoddle is the person at Marathon who built the block template. So definitely stick around for Thursday for that show. Yeah, I highly recommend it. Definitely listen to it, especially if you're a Bitcoin miner who's not really looked at how Bitcoin mining works under the hood. I think this is one of the best hour and a half conversations you could have where you you may get different perspectives than some of the other Bitcoin mining shows. I don't think there's a lot of people who've had this particular conversation with this level of engineer. Uh, so definitely go and listen to that when it comes out later. Awesome. Yeah, different than ASICs, but uh, 
the world of Bitcoin development and mining are quickly what's it coming together? Conflating. Integrating. There we go. That's the word I was looking for. Come Let's close out. <laughs> Thanks for listening to the mining pod. Check us out on Spotify, Apple, YouTube, elsewhere, and give us a review. Kind of helps out. So see you guys next week. <laughs>